So it says in your little booklet thingies that I'm preaching on Titus 3. I'm staying in the same book, but I'm actually, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to have a cheeky sort of fly through the whole of Titus. So we should, you know, strap your seatbelts on and we'll just have a little whiz around and uh, see where it takes us. But what we're going to do, if you, if you want to open your Bibles to Titus, you are going to need them, I promise. Uh, but I'm going to pray for us, right? As we continue worshipping God by um, studying his word together. Let's pray together. Father, we, we love you. We're so thankful for Jesus. Well, who would we be? Where would we be without that great work of salvation that you have wrought in our lives? I'm thankful as well that you don't leave us just fumbling around in the dark looking for truth, but that you've revealed it to us in your word. And uh, just help us, Lord, to focus, to concentrate. Give us ears to hear, we pray, and give us hearts that uh, melt at the sound of gospel truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, when I first walked into uh, off the streets and into a church, I was completely clueless, okay? Uh, I, I, I didn't know one end of the Bible from another. Um, I was as biblically illiterate a person as you were ever going to find. And one of the earliest mistakes I made in uh, going to church was assuming that I was the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> and assuming that everybody here obviously knows everything about the Bible, right? And as far as I was concerned, if you'd been going to church for any length of time, then you were a theological genius, right? You were an expert on everything to do with God. And so what I did, what all new converts do when they come to the faith, I pestered everybody with every single question I could think of. And here's the thing, when, wh whatever anybody told me, I believe them, right? They're Christian-y people, they wear nice stuff, some of them smell nice. <laughs> I believe what they taught me. And um, the problem was, you see, I was street-wise but church dumb. And it didn't take me long to find out that actually I wasn't the dumbest person in the room. Lots of dumb people out there. And uh, people taught me all sorts of weird stuff in the early years. Um, apparently God was happiest if I wore a tie. <laughs> I did for the first three months of my faith wear a shirt and tie. You need to know that about me. I have publicly repented and I'm happy to do so. <laughs> Lord has forgiven me and so should you, so don't judge. Um, I was told he'd be angry if I posted a letter on a Sunday. Apparently there was one true version of the Bible and the rest were inspired by the devil. I was told that Jesus may have saved uh, my soul, but that I would be a drug addict for the rest of my life. And that's why I was grateful to my first pastor. He's a dude called uh, Anthony Finney. Hand up if you know Anthony Finney. Exactly. The Lord knows Anthony Finney. What a faithful pastor. That guy was, he was a godly man, he was a decent man, he, no clue about life in my world, just as I had no clue about life in his world. But that guy taught me a, a lot of really important things, but one of the most important things he ever said to me was this, Mez, know your Bible. By knowing uh, the word of God, he said to me, you will know the mind of God. And if anybody teaches you anything, that conflicts with the mind of God, then it is they who are confused because God never lies. And that's the best bit of advice I think I ever received. Because you see, as my Christian life wore on, I ran into uh, misguided Christians. I ran into angry Christians. I ran, I ran into bitter Christians. I ran into false teachers. I ran into people teaching all sorts of weird and wacky stuff. And without the guidance of uh, that pastor 
and another godly man who taught me the Bible, I would have been swallowed up in the early years. I wouldn't have survived the church. And sadly, in my Christian life, I have seen so many friends fall by the wayside, destroyed by sin, destroyed uh, by false teaching. And this is the sort of stuff that's going on in Crete around 60 to 65 AD as we jump into the letter of Titus. Paul is uh, writing here to a young church planter, if you like, called Titus, funnily enough, the name of the book. And even though he was facing some very culturally specific problems, there is still a great application for our day. And as Paul writes this letter, it's very clear the church is in a bit of trouble. If you look at uh, verse 5 of chapter 1, and, and Paul writes, he says, this, Look, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint every." Yeah, appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So we know, we know that the main problem was that there were false teachers and false prophets doing great damage uh, in the church. And they needed to be sorted out. And time and again in the New Testament, we see warning after warning after warning about false teaching and false, cre- uh, yeah, false creatures as well as teachers creeping into the church. Matthew 7.15, we're warned about false prophets. In Mark chapter 13, verse 22, we're warned. Paul warns that the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 29, against savage wolves. He warns the church in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, or is it 2 Corinthians 11? I've heard that's a thing out here. It's 2 Corinthians 11, right? Yeah, cool. So it's 2 then. So... <laughs> I'm looking at Mike, for, he's, he's giving the, affirm- the Trinitarian affirmative nod, so three nods, it's a perfect number. So, in 2 Corinthians 11, he warns about f- those who will teach another Jesus. Paul warns Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 4, in the first three verses, about the same thing. He says, some will come and try and pervert the truth, others will depart from the faith. In his second letter to Timothy in chapter 3, he's even more explicit. He warns against false teachers who are are worming their way into people's lives and homes. Again, 2 Peter 2 is just as dire warns about false prophets. 1 John 2 warns against antichrists. 2 John 7 talks about deceivers. We could go on and on. This stuff is all over the scriptures. And my point is this. We better be planning for problems in our ministries from the get-go. If you are in a church, you are going to have problem people. If you are in a church, you probably are a problem person. That's a guaranteed fact. We are going to come up against false teaching and false teachers. And our job as shepherds, then, is to feed the flock, care for the diseased lambs, and shoot the wolves. And we are foolish and naive if we do not think that there are false teachers, wolves, and liars out there ready to destroy our churches and wreak havoc among our congregations. Churches are full of these people. Seminaries (laughs) are full of these people. The blogosphere is full of these people. And in Crete, they were ravaging the people. So what's the problem? What's the problem in in the church? Well, the, the problem is that these people are teaching false doctrine. And Paul says, Titus must deal with it. If you look at the language, you just skim your eyes through chapter one. And you see all sorts of language. Many insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers especially those of the Jewish heritage, he says in verse 10. That's strong stuff. He goes on to call them liars, gluttons, lazy beasts in verse 12. He says that they turn away from the truth in verse 14. These teachers were uh, obviously teaching a perversion of the faith through Jewish myths. 
you look at ch uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, and I've got no, no clear idea exactly what they were teaching, but suffice to say that their focus was clearly not centered on the gospel of Jesus. Their emphasis was elsewhere. And, and, and again, it, it, it was a common problem in the early church. In, in uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 4, we read these words where false teachers, they paid attention to myths, endless genealogies, genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. So obviously these people are legalists in some sense in that they promoted the commandments of men over the word of God. And these people obviously thought they were being pure by keeping the Old Testament laws, but they weren't. Look at verse 15. They weren't pure. In fact, they had defiled minds and consciences. Christ deniers, detestable, disobedient, unfit for purpose. Go to chapter 3 in verses 10 and 11. Divisive, warped, sinful, self-condemned. So if you think I'm blunt, Paul is ruthless in this little book. In fact, he calls these false teachers useless. They use words for power, full of fruitless talk, proclaiming a powerless religion. They say they know him, but in chapter 1, verse 16, he says their behavior gives them away. You see, what we, what we believe will always be proved by how we live. The scriptures say, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, this, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 5, th uh, this is what we were once like, he reminds them, but we're like it no more. Why not, he says. Again, if you look at chapter 3, verse 5, why not? Because we've been saved from our wicked, rebellious hearts to become followers of him, devoted to him, devoted to his people, devoted to good works. Paul wants Titus to know that he has to sort these people out. He cannot just ignore them and hope they go away and, or that it all gets better by itself. You know, one of my best friends uh, in the world, a friend of mine called Benny, uh, Benny's got cancer. And it was recently diagnosed with cancer. And here's what, here's what Benny didn't want to hear from his doc when he went into the surgery. He didn't want to hear, Benny, you got cancer, big man. He's, he's a big lad. And, uh, but don't worry about it, pal. Don't you worry about it, big man. Just try and ignore it. Hope for the best. And, you know, maybe it'll go away all on its own. Okay? Who knows, you know, what will happen? No. What Benny wanted was the doctor to do everything he possibly could to cure him. Benny wanted that disease cut out of him. He didn't want it to spread to the other parts of his body. That was his big paranoia, I remember, in the early months. And that's the point of Titus here. There's a problem in the churches. Titus has to deal with it decisively. And, and many, many church leaders try and ignore problems like these. They smile, they hope for the best. Or they try and reason with such people. But unchecked sin and unchecked false teaching is a disease that spreads through the church. And we have to be ruthless in cutting it out for the good of the wider body. Now listen, I'm not talking about becoming the secret police and hunting down every case of sin in your church, right? Flipping out, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning, would we? We'd have the wife and the kids excommunicated before breakfast. <laughs> but we're talking about flagrant, public, and unrepentant sin of false teaching that calls into question the honor of the name of Jesus, the centrality of the gospel, brings the church into disrepute and divides the people of God. If we don't deal with it in our churches, <clears throat> then, we're gonna, then they're going to become sick, they're going to become weak, and they're going to become worthless. And they will die 
as so many have back in my homeland, as so many have here, I understand, right? So if you think of Christianity in the UK as sort of being on life support, you know, in the critical care unit, we're struggling, okay? And if you think of us, you know, in the critical care unit, lying on our beds, full of regrets. And the main thing, the main one being, I think, maybe we should have taken better care of our health. Maybe we should have taken steps earlier to deal with some of the poison in our churches. Then maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. You see, we didn't just allow uh, wolves into our churches back in the UK. We gave them a seat at the table. We let them shepherd the sheep. And now we're surprised that many of the sheep have been eaten or badly mauled. And all we're left with are packs of wolves churning out lies and deceit to a gullible, godless nation with no biblical knowledge or spiritual discernment whatsoever. Now, I want to be very clear, because that sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? Just let's wander around and beat up a few false teachers, which would be fun. (laughs) But we need to understand the difference in our congregations between false teaching and theological and doctrinal immaturity. So, most of the people in my church are heretics. It's a fact. In so much as they they understand very little about the Bible at this point in their Christian experience. Now, if I disciplined, you know, or locked in a cupboard, everyone who said anything dumb or unbiblical, well, I'd be in a cupboard for a start, but I'd have nobody left in the room. But we must act when it comes to sinful practice. Listen to Paul again, Romans 16, verse 17, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Listen, I can assure you that we all, everyone in this room who's a Christian, we all began life as a heretic. Amen? Even Tim Keller was a heretic once, right? Mike Rees, were you a heretic once? Yeah. Dodgy guy, that guy. We all start somewhere in the Christian life. We've got to be very, very careful. I remember my early days as a believer, and I was back witnessing to my homeless friends on the streets. And you know what it's like, right? You come to Jesus, you're full of beans, right, about the Lord. And uh, so I took this guy from the church, this young Christian dude. Poor lad. Now I think back, I feel really bad for him. But, you know, he was the right square. Is square a thing here? You know, walks with the butt cheeks clenched, and <laughs> and he was just walking with me. I said, "Well, come on the streets, big man. We'll tell some people about Jesus." And uh, he was as nervous. Obviously, he was as nervous about the streets as I was about.
lying on the floor. All going, yeah, peanut M&M, man. That's, uh. So here's my point. In the early days of my faith, I pretty much heard and repeated whatever was spouted to me. I had absolutely zero spiritual and theological discernment, okay? Zero. Now, here's my point, and it's really important we understand. I was wrong, but I wasn't false. I was sometimes guilty of the most horrifically heretical awfulness, but it was childlike mistakes that I quickly corrected given the right instruction. That is completely different from people in our churches who will not take correction, who will divide the flock, and who will persistently seek to lead weak sheep away. Now, was my teaching false in many places? Of course it was false. But I was an ill-informed sheep, not a destructive wolf. And the difference pastorally is quite profound. So we have to be careful. That's why we've got to be very wise when we're dealing with these issues. There's a difference between a false teacher and one who is still in the process of learning and may not have all the facts straight. An obvious example, Acts 18, 24, turn with me. We, we see Priscilla, don't we, and Aquila meeting Apollos. We read in Acts 18, 24, at that time a Jew named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was an educated man from Alexandria. He knew the scriptures very well. Apollos had been taught the way of the Lord. He spoke with great power. He taught the truth about Jesus. Listen up. But he only knew about John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Priscilla and Aquila heard him. So they invited him to their home. And there, they gave him a better understanding of the way of God. So let's be cool about some of this stuff. Let's be on it. But remember, many of our people, especially first-generation Christians, are just not going to have it all right. And they're not going to have it all right for a very long time. But we mustn't allow false teachers and rebellious spirited people into our pulpits and other places of worship. A preacher can be forgiven anything, or a preacher can be forgiven if he doesn't get everything right as long as he's open to correction. I mean, I've stood in my pulpit and corrected myself after saying something not quite on point. I think many of us could do with a bit more humility because I think we're trying to set ourselves up as infallible sort of guys who never get it wrong. Well, we do, don't we? We make mistakes, we say it. Oh. And I think we need to model that in our churches. But, you know, this is, what, was, what I was talking about myself is very different from what's going on in Crete. If you look at verse 11 of, of, of chapter 1, these people were obviously upsetting whole families. They were affecting people, undermining their confidence in Christ. So if that's the problem, if the problem is there's false teaching, there's, the, 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 there's false prophets wandering around, upsetting families, dividing God's people, what's the solution? What, what is Paul saying that Timothy must do about it? Or even Titus? Well, firstly, he says you to teach them sound doctrine. Look at verse 13. He says, this testimony is true. Rebuke them sharply. Why? So that they may be sound in the faith. So to deal with the poison in our churches, we, we must drip feed people biblical and theological soundness into every pore. You know, there's a lie in my country. I don't know if it's here, but it's definitely in my country. There's a lie in my country that says pursuing sound doctrine is somehow an unspiritual act. So the Holy Spirit, he works through music and singing and making us feel good, but he certainly doesn't work through doctrine, right? That's for, that's for boffins. That's for geezers up there. That's not for us. And it's worse in my communities, much worse. It's worse in my communities with, where, where people have got real physical needs, where many of my friends have not finished their educations. 
And according to, to some, you know, doctrine is above and beyond my people. Apparently, just give the poor Jesus and a big hug and it will, everything will be okay. And it's not okay. It's never been okay. And all this has done has left us with a gaping spiritual void in our communities that is now being filled by half-baked charlatan prosperity preaching heretic fruit bats. <laughs> Try and tweet that. That's just a bit quick. Right? <laughs> and here's the thing that we need to understand. Doctrine does not kill. Actually, it is the lack of doctrine that does the damage. People are dying spiritually. People are undernourished. People are unable to stand up to even the most basic temptations of the enemy. People are crumbling under uh, a satanic onslaught. They are weak and they need sound doctrine as much as they need our sympathy and our mercy. They need the life-giving, soul-stirring, spirit-feeding nourishment of the Word of God. And the cure for many of the ills inflicting our churches are godly men administering godly, meaty, spiritual truth in accordance with sound doctrine. That's what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. Look at chapter 2, 7 and 8. Show yourself, he says, in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. We are to teach our soundness with seriousness. I think we've all established I like a bit of a crack. C-R-A-I-C, not crack crack, okay? I like a joke. I'm a bit of a boy. But here, the pulpit is not the place for misdirected humor when it comes to teaching the seriously deep truths of the Bible. Because you know, the sheep have more access to more spiritual nonsense from more multimedia outlets than probably any time in history. The wolf doesn't sneak in the back door anymore. The wolf logs on every day into our people's lives. And therefore, the antidote to poor teaching is not shouting louder and beating the sheep harder. It is kind, enduring, patient, long-suffering teaching of sound doctrine. The boring stuff, fellas. Because it's the boring stuff that's going to keep our people alive. And we must forget the lie. And it's a whopper, this one that says if a brother or sister cannot read very well, they cannot learn very well. That's a big, fat lie. The great tragedy of much of church ministry to the poor is that we feed them scraps in the mistaken assumption that they can't digest real food, and then we wonder why they're not growing and moving on from their chaotic lifestyles. The problem might be you. It might be me. Have you thought of that? You know, when Jesus said, feed my sheep, I'm sure he didn't mean just give, you know, uh, just give the strong ones the good stuff and let the weak take the scraps off the table. And it might take more time. It might take more money. It's certainly going to take more imagination and effort. But we must ensure that we are teaching sound doctrine to all of the sheep, even the so-called runts of the litter. And doctrine is healthy when it is encouraging believers to grow in maturity and not splinter into divided factions. You see, our people cannot be deceived when they're being fed a steady diet of biblical truth and Christian doctrine. So we're not, we're not called to be superstars in the ministry. We're called to be faithful shepherds who feed and nourish our people. That's the first point he says. False teaching? Teach sound doctrine. What else did he say? Secondly, he says, 
appoint trustworthy elders. That's what we read in 1 verse 5. What did he say, remember? If you look again, remind yourself. That's why I left you. What to do? Well, firstly, put what remained in order, and two, appoint elders in every town. Why? Why so important that we do this? Well, because who else is going to lead the way in this teaching of sound doctrine? That's what he says in chapter 1, verse 9. That's the point. If you look at 2, verse 1, as for you, teach what's, what accords with sound doctrine. Doctrine. And of course he's talking to Titus. Of course the specific context is Titus and this context. But he's talking to us too. He's instructing Titus here. Teach men and women sound doctrine. That they too may teach men and women sound doctrine. And, and any, any church discipline, any, any church discipline carried out by a lone ranger without wide-ranging support and input from fellow mature believers, will quickly degenerate into heavy shepherding and cult-like behaviorism. You need to trust me on this, because I've got geezers who are in council estates on their own, and they, 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 they are just running cults almost. Well-meaning, loving brothers, but just want to rule on their own to keep control. We need to grow elders, and they must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. Why? So that they can refute what is false. That's what he says. And of course, they ha- they're to have a seriously, <laughs> it's a serious set of moral, moral qualifications. But here's the point. Elders must know the truth as much as they know the sheep. Elders should be faithful to their wives, their children, their families, their fellow elders, their congregations, their Lord, and the truth of the Scriptures. Elders shouldn't be hot-headed and quick-tempered. That's important. That's important given the amount of pastoral problems that come our way, right? Come on, hands up if you really sometimes want to strangle some of you people. Not a boozer, not a lover of money, not violent. Self-controlled, disciplined, upright, holy. They must love what is good, he says. Self-controlled, again, is of huge importance because we do want to sometimes strangle our people. And there are people in our churches who drive us to the edge of distraction we have to keep our emotions in check, don't we? Of course, I'm not suggesting we're robots, right? We get emotional. Well, I get emotional when I see people suffering in my, I I love my people. But we must never act out of personal frustration and anger. And, And my weaknesses in certain areas of character flaws are tempered by men, other men, elders, who pull me back, or I pull them back. That's the beauty of eldership. That's why it exists, right? And some discipline issues are so emotionally charged, we must be careful that we're acting in honoring, patient, and self-controlled ways. You know, some of the best elders in the world may not set the world on fire as preachers but they can apply the Bible with pastoral wisdom in tight situations. They're the dudes you want, right? We're all looking for the superstars or to be them. We need godly, wise men who can act with restraint, administer sound doctrine in tight situations. Thirdly, I'm going to whip through them. He says, practice, how long have I got? Am I good? I'll just keep going then. Thirdly, he says, practice comprehensive discipline. Mm. So, you know, we shouldn't do church discipline just because we, you know, saw Mark Dever on a podcast. You know, we've got like, you know, we sleep with our nine marks books under the pillow. Some people, I think they do that. Um, We do it because... The Lord thinks it's necessary for the protection of the flock for which he shed his lifeblood. And there are some in in my culture, I can't answer to yours, in my culture there are some that think, ooh, 
discipline heavy. Can you imagine what the word discipline sounds like in my culture? Forget general UK middle class culture. In my culture, where the word discipline is equated with abuse. People see it's a bit over the top. Let's concentrate on the good things going on in our churches. But listen, imagine if a hospital opened its doors and announced, look, we're no longer going to treat the sick. But if you're feeling well, you're welcome to pop by any time for a chat. It would be ridiculous, right? You see, we need more straight talking in our churches, not less. I mean, you look at the challenge. Just r- run with me now. Chapter 1. Look at the challenge of Titus. Chapter 1, verse 11. They must be silenced, these false teachers. That sounds pretty hard, right? Look what he says in verse 13. Rebuke them sharply. Jump down to 2. Chapter 2, verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self controlled. Jump down to 12, training us to renounce ungodliness. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Go to verse 8. Insist on these things. Look at verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, self-condemned. So, you know, Paul hasn't come, or Paul isn't t- telling Titus to hand out spiritual hugs and kisses. The church is sinking under all sorts of issues, and his advice isn't to win people or pray about it, although those are good ideas. He says in 3 verse 9, avoid the foolish. In other words, shun them. Obviously, the context again, Judaizers adding to the gospel of Jesus, people debating over stupid words and myths. But some people plainly need to be denounced. Plain and simple. Some people are so unprofitable and useless, there's no debating with them. We need to get shot of them. And his commands are uncompromising and unflinching. Face these issues head on. Tackle these issues head on. How abrasive is this language? It's pretty abrasive, right? Because we're a bit mollycoddled. In the UK, they're a bit more mollycoddled. I don't know what men are like in Canada, but UK men are a bit, oh, that sounds a bit harsh. Let's have a mochaccino or something and talk about it. See, it's it's a bit abrasive to our ears. You see, we don't mind leaving a, a strongly worded response on a blog post, do we? Or trolling some poor sap on Twitter because he mixed up his Greek verbs or something, right? But stick us in front of a real life wolf. We all want to stroke it and give it a saucer of milk, you know, and flip it over and stroke its little belly. Get it dealt with, or it'll bite you, and it'll spread rabies to all who come into contact with it. And we read language like Titus, and we want to caveat every word. Well, you know, um, maybe he didn't mean rebuke. Maybe he meant snuggle. (laughs) I think the Hebrew, the Greek here is, is quite confusing. It can mean to snuggle softly. Right? You want to make the words sound more loving and kind, but look at the language. Verse 11, they must be silenced. I mean, that's pretty mafiosa, right? Rebuking them sharply, urging them, training them to renounce ungodliness, declare, exhort, remind, insist on these things, warn them, exclude them. So whatever the list of qualifications uh, mean for an elder in Titus, it doesn't mean men without backbone. It doesn't mean that. Because that's a lie of the world, right? A couple of lies out there. Sort of all sort of, ooh, poncy. Christian men. A bit sort of effeminate and that. Watch Downton Abbey. 
and Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> which, if you do, that's your gig. <laughs> Some big guy's going to come up to you go, oh, watch it. <laughs> so. But on the other hand, you've got a lie of the world, haven't you, that it's creeped into the church right now, crept into the church. I don't think creeped is the right word to use, but, um, you know, men need to watch cage fighting and drink craft beer, right? But what about words like gentleness and self-control and hospitable? That doesn't seem to fit in with the world's idea of manliness. And yet elders are called to be these things, but have backbone. There seems to be a view in the world that you can't be kind and gentle and be a man. You've got to be a girl. You're watching the I'm watching the cage fight, and it's got a few beers down us, and we... And churches setting up fight clubs and stuff in the UK. I think I said this in my breakout lesson. There's nothing more cringe-worthy, nothing more cringe-worthy and horrible than guys, Christian guys, setting up fight clubs in their churches, but they have to be closed by half eight because they don't want to miss Downton. <laughs> Stop it. Elders have got to be these things, gentle and kind and godly and manly, but firm and sure and unrelenting in the face of opposition. We have to guard our pulpits. We have to guard against those who seek to infiltrate our groups in an effort to influence people. Do you know there is more anti-biblical, gospel-perverting nonsense that gets taught in support groups, alcoholic and addiction counseling, Uh, and offenders groups than anywhere else in the church. Somehow, the rest of the church, let's make sure we're getting taught, we keep it solid, we keep it on doctrine, but then you have groups, churches that have these little groups to reach out to the homeless or the poor and whatever, and none of it's, none of it's kept in check. What are we teaching these dudes? Most of it's nonsense. We've got to be on our guard. I live and work among first-generation believers. I live and work among babies in Christ. And it's a blessing and it's a danger. You know what it's like if you've had children? You know what it's like when you've got kids? You can just, the best time is when you can just leave them on the floor. You go out of the room, you come back, and they're still lying there. It's great. But then they start functioning, don't they? And moving. And then walking. And then sticking fingers in sockets and stuff. And it's not the best feeling, is it? They get a little bit more independent and it's exciting. And it's a worry. And, you know, I don't want them to get hurt. That's how I feel about my congregation. That's how I feel about my guys. They're young and there are so many wolves at the door ready to tear them apart. And, you know, sometimes I'll often get people who come by and want to pass on their... I mean, I've, do, you know, do anybody else get this? Wandering prophets? hey, I'm a prophet, the Lord sent me to you to come and share my wisdom with your people. Yeah, well, he sent me a message for you. Bog off. (laughs) Don't get many as they used to. Maybe there's a group of them and they've sort of (laughs) blacklisted me, but there's guys out there, you know, they've got a word of knowledge or some spurious prophecy. I'm not not making comment about these things. I'm just saying that there are lots of spuriousness out there that my young guys will eat up. And, and, and these people have to be muzzled, Paul says. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. Brothers and sisters, we're asking you to warn certain people. These people don't want to work. That sounds like some of my boys. Instead, they make trouble. But we're also asking you to encourage those who have lost hope. Help those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. You know, false teachers are not just found on American televangelist channels. They roam the streets of Scotland. They're in Canada too, I bet. They inhabit our pulpits, our theological faculties. And poor communities around the world are breeding grounds for ravenous wolves, eager to pounce on the vain hopes of the poor and the needy. And that's why we need more sound teaching in our churches, not less. And we have to fight the, 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 the thought of the world that says, I can do what I like, I can say what I like, and I can believe what I like. Because quite clearly, we cannot. We must believe what the Scripture teaches. 
We must act in accord with that, and we must submit to the Lordship of King Jesus. We're not our own. We were bought, and we were bought for community, not individuality. And it's this sort of thinking that can take a hold early on in the life of a church when we are full of babes. And this is a particularly strong warning if you want to plan a church. Young Christians are susceptible to any teacher that sounds convincing because they haven't developed the ability to fend for themselves just yet. And that's why, I think Mike said it yesterday, we must do it. But, on the other hand, we mustn't keep our people <clears throat> just drinking milk formula, right? That's the problem in many churches. We must help them to grow. Next, he says, is this my final point? Let me have a look. It's my final point. Well done. Finally, he says to them, model godliness. Again, chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. How do we model it? Well, he tells him, doesn't he, in chapter 2, verse 8, we model by both living and teaching. Again, 1 Peter 2, 15 says, you silence the foolishness of ignorant men by your holy conduct. Pastors don't sit on ivory thrones, dispensing wisdom and three-point sermons. We must live with our people. We must model godliness. Poor, poor church discipline, poor community in our churches, it makes a liar out of God, and it denies the life-transforming power of the gospel. You see, we don't just turn away from an old life when we come to Christ. We embrace a whole new life. We and we need godly men and women who will model what that looks like. What does it look like for a lad who knocked up three girls in the scheme, is out drinking every night, clouts his missus around the back of the head every now and again, comes to faith in Jesus Christ? How's he going to be a father? Never known his dad. Never known anything but violence. He's going to know that because I stand at the teeth, and this is, what, this is what the Bible says about fatherhood. Right? Yeah, correct. But he needs to see it in action. He needs to be shown it. He needs to experience it. You know, the heart of good church discipline is Christians challenging one another to bring their deeds back into line with their claim to have an intimate knowledge with God. Church, good church discipline, if it's working well in your church, corrects not only poor teaching, but poor living, right? And in other words, our people need to know that how we live matters. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job unless I quoted from at least one Scotsman. Eric Little. We've all heard of Eric Little? Yeah? Chariots of Fire and all that chat? Right. Well, Eric died in a Chinese internment camp at a young age. Here were some words. Who wrote this? So, some words were written by one of his fellow internees. Is that a word? Internees? Come on, big man. Yeah, okay. <laughs> It is now. If Don Carson can do it, so can I. <laughs> Internees. Listen to these words written about Eric Little. Great man of faith, right? Great Scotsman. Listen, February the 24th. Eric, <clears throat> Eric's funeral today. It was not particularly clever. It's a bit harsh, right? <laughs> the guy's just died. He was not particularly clever and not conspicuously able. But he was good. He was naturally reserved and he tended to live in a world of his own but he gave him himself unstintedly. He always shrank from revealing his deepest needs and distresses, so that while he bore the burdens of many, very few could help to bear his. He wasn't a great leader or an inspired thinker, but he knew what he ought to do, and he did it. He was a true disciple of the master. How about that for a... Is it an epitaph? Right? What's that called? Eulogy. Not flash, not showy, just an ordinary fella lived his life for the glory of God within his own limitations. Died in ignominy. But he affected people. That's why we've got to challenge sin 
in our churches because every unrepentant act is open rebellion against the Lord we have professed to follow. And remember, when we're challenging our people over teaching and behavior, we're not saying become more like us. We're saying become more like Jesus. And look at, um, finally, look at verses 11 to 14 of chapter 2, because this is the heartbeat. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The grace of God has appeared in the gospel and it brings salvation. It's the only salvation. There is no other salvation. We cannot add to it and escape unharmed. We cannot take from it and escape unpunished. We must care for our sheep, love our sheep. We must root out false teachers and those who would divide our people. We must practice church discipline because nothing less than the honor of the Lord is at stake. The gospel's at stake. Jesus is coming again. That's worth a cheeky amen. Is he coming again? I think he's coming again. He's the blessed hope of verse 13. Listen, all we're doing now, selling books, hanging around in conferences and, you know, eating Tim Horton's Oh, that turned off when I said Tim Horton's donuts. <laughs> All we're doing now is waiting around for him to appear. The gospel lies at the heart of everything we're trying to do. We want people to live lives that honor Jesus as we wait for his appearing. And so we do what we do because of Jesus and for the honor and glory of his name. Not because people annoy us, or they do. Not because we like wielding authority, but because we want to honor Jesus in our communities and we want our people to do likewise. Jesus redeemed us from our sins for the good works we read about in chapter 2, verse 14. Remember, our job is to nurture those unfit for anything to become fit for God's especially designed purpose for their lives. We want to reprove people to win them, if we can, not to lose them, but we must reprove people strongly when they are denying Christ by their words or their actions. And may the Lord help us be faithful shepherds as we contend for the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks very much.